Good morning and welcome back to our Tuesday morning Bible class from Bethlehem Lutheran Church here in Menominee Falls in Germantown, Wisconsin. I'm Pastor Phil Arnold and we're going to be picking up where we left off last week in Revelation chapter 14. Uh, so there is a new lesson that's posted in our Facebook feed called Revelation Lesson 12 and it covers uh, chapter 14 verses 1 to 20. Um, we're in the vision of the seven signs, the third major vision of the book, and uh, we'll be looking at uh, the, the signs um, four, five, and six, uh, kind of the last three parts of the vision of the seven signs. Um, the seventh sign in that vision is itself a transition into the next, uh, into the next set of, of visions, the seven vials. Um, <clears throat> so that's where we're going to be picking up today. Again, a new lesson uh, posted on the Facebook feed covering chapter 14, verses 1 to 20. And that's where we'll be in our um, in the Bible in Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 to 20. But let's begin our study of the word with prayer. So we pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we give you our thanks and praise that you have revealed yourself to us on the pages of Scripture, that you have revealed your unfathomable love that led you to come to this world and to offer yourself as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. We ask that as we study your word this morning, that you would richly bless us, that we might see the depth of your love for us, and that we might be reminded of the justice of the last day, when we will be rescued from sin and all of its consequences. We ask this in all things, in your holy name. Amen. Okay, so thank you for joining us again as we continue our study of the book of Revelation. Um, just what I'd like to just spend one moment doing is reviewing what we talked about last week in chapter 13. Um, Revelation 13 is a very important chapter of the Bible. It's a very misunderstood chapter of the Bible. Um, it is the beast out of the earth. I'm uh, sorry, the beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth. Um, so the beast out of the sea covers chapters 13, chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. And what we identified the beast out of the sea is, is, is evil, evil government, government that stands against God, whether it's the Roman government, which would have been to the original audience, or any other government in the history of, of, the, of, of the world that has been hostile to, the, to Christianity and the Christian message. Um, that's, uh, that's what the beast out of the sea represents. And then the beast out of the earth represents false teachers. So anyone who comes and um, proclaims a message supposedly from God that goes against what God's word says. So false prophets and false teachers. That's the beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth. Um, so we've seen uh, the first, uh, what is it, the first four symbols, first three symbols, um, the first three signs in this vision. The woman and the the woman, and then the dragon, and then the the woman and the dragon would be number one. The beast out of the sea would be number two, and the beast out of the earth would be number three. What we're going to be looking at today in chapter fourteen are signs four, five, and six. So sign number four is the lamb and the hundred forty-four thousand. So that covers chapter fourteen, verse one through five. And then vision or the sign number five is the vision of the three angels, which is chapter 14, um, which goes from verse 6 through 13. And then the sixth vision, the harvesting or the wine press, the trampling of the wine press of God, um, is chapter 14, verses 14 through 20. So that's kind of the division of what we're going to be looking at today, the, um, the three. Um, the three signs or the three parts of this vision that we're going to be looking at. But let's go ahead and start with chapter 14, verses 1 to 5, which is the fourth uh, sign, the fourth of this in this set of visions, the Lamb and the 144,000. So uh, chapter 14, verse 1, Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him, 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. 
And I heard a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the Lord and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as firstfruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. So, a, a couple of interesting things that are going on in this section and one extremely difficult detail of interpretation. Um, and we'll, we'll see that as we go through. But what I think is especially interesting or beautiful about the opening verses of this section is that they draw upon pictures that we've already seen elsewhere in the book of Revelation. And so the, the um, first set of questions that I have, number one on the study guide, um, you know, who is the lamb? Who are the four living creatures? Who are the elders? Who are the 144,000? And then what is Mount Zion? With the exception of that last one, Mount Zion, these are all symbols that have been used elsewhere in the book of Revelation. And this is a reminder to us um, that Revelation, like all of the Bible, um, we let scripture interpret scripture. It's always good to let one section of the book help you understand other sections of the book. It can be uh, difficult because sometimes symbols are used in different ways in the book. But at least in this particular case, um, the examples of the symbols that we have are being used consistently. Um, and we're, we're drawing from imagery, especially from chapter 4, which you'll remember is that interlude between the vision of this, uh, be, between the seven letters, the seven churches, and the first set of major visions, which is the opening of the seven seals. In chapters 4 and 5, we have this picture of the throne room of God. And in that throne room of God, we've got the Lamb at the center of the throne, surrounded by the four living creatures, surrounded by the 24 elders, surrounded by the church or the angels. And so we've got um, a lot of these symbols that were from chapter 4 appearing again here in chapter 14. And that makes the identification of a lot of these symbols very easy. So the lamb who is standing on Mount Zion with the 144,000, this is obviously a positive picture. And so the lamb represents Jesus. He is the lamb that was slain from all eternity. Um, and it's a beautiful picture of him as the sacrifice that makes us members of the church, um, that makes us um, part of the 144,000. So it, it's very fitting or appropriate that the vision would begin with the Lamb, because he's the one that makes the 144,000 a part of the church. The four living creatures that we see in verse 3 come from chapter 4. They're great, these powerful angels, either cherubim or seraphim. We're not exactly sure um, if those are different or if they're the same, and if so, which one outranks the other. Um, but they're mighty angels that serve as the honor guard of God. Um, and so remember, these are the ones that have the, the wings that are touching and they're covered with eyes because you can't sneak up on the honor guard of God. And they're singing their song, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. So you've got um, this uh, honor guard of God. That's the four living creatures. Again, this is just a symbol that's taken right out of chapter four. And then the 24 elders. Again, this is a symbol taken right out of chapter four. Um, representatives of the Old and New Testament church. So remember the, the, the apocalyptic number for the church is the number 12. Uh, so you've got 12, you got 24 elders in total. So 12 of the Old Testament, the 12 tribes of Israel, 12 from the New Testament, the 12 apostles. Um, and so that you've got representatives or the leaders of God's Old and New Testament church. And then even the symbol of 144,000, is as something we've already seen in the book of Revelation. This comes from um, chapter 7, um, when we identify the 144,000 as God's elect. So it's the number for the church times the number for the church 
times the number for perfection cubed. So perfection times perfection times perfection. Just like the most holy place in the tabernacle or temple was 10 cubits by 10 cubits by 10 cubits. So you've got the number 12 times 12 and then 10, 10, and 10. That's where the number 144,000 comes from. So the 144,000 represents the entirety of God's elect people um, in the history of time. And uh, the one symbol that is a little different or is one that we haven't seen already in the book of Revelation is this idea of Mount Zion. Now, Mount Zion is, uh, is the name of the mountain. And using the word mountain is, is being kind. It's really more of a hill. But it is the highest point in the area on, on the plain, um, and it's where the temple was built. So a lot of times when you, when you hear about Mount Zion, they're talking about the mountain, the temple mount, the place where, um, where the temple was built. And remember that the temple it represents many things, but above all, the temple represents the place where God dwells with his people, the place where God dwells amidst his people. If you wanted to go to where God was, then you went to the temple. This is why, for example, um, when Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, she wants to talk about the difference between M Mount Zion and Mount Gerizim. The Jews said you had to worship God on Mount Zion, and the Samaritans said you had to worship God on Mount Gerizim, and so she wants him to kind of, um, you know, officiate um, or be a referee, who's right, Jews or Samaritans? And Jesus very famously says, the time is coming and now has come when it doesn't matter what on what mountain you worship God, what God is looking for is worshipers who worship him in spirit and in truth. Um, but this idea of Mount Zion as being the, temp, the temple mount, the place where God dwells with his people, and that is the, that's the, the important part of the symbol. So Mount Zion is the place where Jesus gathers with his people. Um, and so we might say Mount Zion is itself a, a symbol for the church. Okay, so you've really got three different symbols for the church in this one section. You've got the 24 elders who are representatives of the Old and New Testament church. You've got the 144,000 which is the entirety of God's elect, the 12 times 12 and 10 times 10 times 10. And then you've got the Mount Zion, which is a, or a reference to the, 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 the church in its entirety, whether first on earth and then ultimately in heaven. Um, so you really got, this is a good example of how three different symbols um, all testify to one truth, um, which is that Jesus is dwelling with the church. Um, we've got um, this uh, this idea of um, of the the one hundred and forty four thousand um, are singing a new song. We're told this is really a reference to Psalm ninety six, verses one through two. So, um, and I printed those verses for you. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. So, why is the song? that's sung to the Lord by the 144,000, a new song. And of course, it isn't new in, in the sense of kind or, or time, I guess I should say. It isn't new in the sense of time. It isn't new in the sense that it's a song that has never been sung before. It's really the, um, it's the new creation. It's the, it's the song of salvation, um, the song of thanksgiving. So think about in chapters 4 and 5, how many times we saw first the four living creatures and then the 24 elders and then all the all of creation and the redeemed singing songs to the Lord. And we had the, the opportunity to comment there. But this, it, we ought not think about these as being songs that had never been sung before, like new songs in a sense of songs that God's ears had never heard. But it is the old song of salvation sung anew. So it's the renewed song of the Lord. And this becomes uh, 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 an idea that is common in the Old Testament. Um, we talked, for example, about the new covenant. Um, we call it the new covenant, even though the new covenant is in time older than the old covenant. The new covenant really goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. 
um, and to Abraham. Um, the Apostle Paul traces it back to Abraham. Um, but uh, and the, the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, actually comes 400 years after um, the quote-unquote um, New Covenant. So when we talk about the New Covenant, we're, talking, we're not talking about the, the most recent covenant, but we're talking about the covenant that is renewed each and every day, the covenant that, of the promise God's promise that he will not remember our sins, that he forgives us our sins or remembers them no more. You know, that same kind of thing going on here with the song. Um, the song that's being sung is the renewed song of salvation. That Every day, the, the salvation of God is renewed. We're, we're saved today just like we were yesterday, and we're going to be saved tomorrow just like we are today. And so the Christian's life is a life of constantly singing the song of salvation to God. Um, that's what that's what's meant by the new song um, that they're singing. But it, another interesting detail about this um, song of the 144,000 is that it's a song that only they can sing. Um, only those who are in the 144,000 can learn this song, and that's kind of an interesting picture or strange image um, <clears throat> and to kind of help us with um, understanding why this symbol is described in this way why the 144,000 or why you have to be a part of the 144,000 to be able to sing the song I've got two references from 1 Corinthians so one um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 3 this is a super important passage. I make my catechism kids memorize this passage every year. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, 3, Therefore I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And here's the really important part. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So, of course, we're not talking about being able to speak the words, Jesus is Lord, but to say those words and to mean it to say those words and to have that faith in your heart that Jesus is actually Lord, um, that Jesus is Lord and Savior, that he is Master and Redeemer. Um, to be able to make that true confession from the heart um, is a special work of the Holy Spirit. We do not choose to become believers. Um, you think about Luther's explanation to the third article of the Apostles' Creed. I cannot, by my own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. So um, we, we have this confidence that we are not what brings us to faith, but the Holy Spirit is the one who brings us to faith. And so um, this is why the 144,000 are the only ones that can sing the new song of salvation, because only believers can sing that new song, and, um, and believers are those in whom the work of the Holy Spirit has been carried out. But then we also have this passage from 1 Corinthians 13, um, this is not maybe as important a passage um, as as chapter twelve is, but it is um, a very in, it is a very interesting thought or a very important thing for us to remember, especially when we're thinking about what heaven is going to be like. So, First Corinthians thirteen, chapter uh, chapter thirteen, verse twelve. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then, when we get to heaven, we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And so this new song of salvation that the 144,000 are singing um, is the song of those who have gotten to heaven and who um, can see in the fullness of, of having been redeemed or, or rescued from all sin, from sin and all of its consequences, that can see the full measure of our redemption. And I just think it's important for us, even, even while we can appreciate that redemption that we have now, we can appreciate our salvation already now as believers, that in some sense that's really what our lives are all about. They're an expression of thankfulness for the salvation that we have. And that's what, what growing in our faith is all about, is growing in our appreciation of the salvation that God has won for us in Christ. The reality is that even my, my appreciation of my salvation right now is itself but a poor reflection, as in a mirror. 
It is um, the, the knowledge of our salvation is only in part. It's still tainted by sin. Our appreciation of salvation is, is, is still um, colored by our sinfulness. We don't, um, as thankful as we are for our salvation, we're never thankful enough. We, we never fully um, grasp how high and wide and long and deep is the love of Christ for us until we get to heaven. And so um, the, the, the song of salvation, or the song of, of the appreciation of our salvation that we'll sing in heaven is even greater than the song that we sing here on earth because our, the song that we sing here on earth is still um, based on a partial knowledge, a knowledge that is tainted or compromised by sin. But when we get to heaven and all sin and all of its consequences are, have been washed away, or maybe better to say, when we're in the new heavens and the new earth, when, when we've gotten our bodies back, um, then we'll be able to sing the, sing the song of, of salvation in a, in a kind, in a way that is different all, even than, than our, our, psalm, our songs here on earth. Um, so that's the, the, um, the, the first part there about the, the that's what I'd say the easy part um, of the, of the um, first, or really the fourth vision, the fourth sign and the vision of the seven signs. But now we get um, to verse 4, chapter 14, verse 4, which um, one uh, Revelation commentator um, cared from 1966. This is quite an old commentary. Um, but he says that uh, Revelation 14.4 is John's most puzzling sentence. The most puzzling sentence in the whole book is um, chapter 14, verse 4. And then um, Sweet, a little more a little more modern of a commentator, um, says that the, the, these words from Revelation 14, 4 are perhaps the most under, misunderstood words in the whole book, which is remarkable because, of course, Revelation is full of very difficult signs to understand. And so this might be the, the most difficult sweetest saying. This is the, um, the, of all the symbols in the book of Revelation, this is the one that's most often misunderstood. And the symbol that they're talking about is in verse 4. The 144,000 are described as those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remained virgins. Um, and... Um, the way, obviously, the way that this has been misinterpreted in the history of the world, in the history of the church, um, is it's been misinterpreted as a way of suggesting that a celibate life, especially for men, a celibate life is a superior um, way of life. It's a more spiritual way of life than is... Um, the married life than is life um, that involves sexual relations. Um, and so that would, again, this is a misunderstanding of the verse. Um, but that's the way that it's interpreted, that to have a, a relationship with a woman, even your wife, um, defiles you. And that it's better or holier or a more sanctified way of living to live a celibate life, to live, you know, to be a virgin. That would be, and I'd just like to make sure we're understanding, I'm, I'm saying that's not the right interpretation. That's the wrong interpretation. And of course, this is what has led, in some, in some times in the history of the church, has led to a very um, misogynistic view of women, a kind of a very negative view of women, that you know, associating with women is defilement. Um, and that, of course, is not at all the case. The Bible is very clear in the book of Genesis, when God created Adam and Eve, he creates both of them in the image of God. The, in the image of God, the very first um, explanation of the image of God is that he created them male and female. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That there is um, no value difference between male and female, between um, men and women that both men and women are equally valuable to God, and that men and women are, e are each um, made in the image of God. Adam and Eve were both made in the image of God. 
Um, so it's not like Adam was made in the image of God and Eve is some kind of lesser creature um, than that. So um, this the way that the, the, the passage, this very difficult passage, has been misunderstood in the history of the church is unfortunate, both because it leads to a misunderstanding about the about marriage, about God's good gift of marriage, and suggests that a celibate life is a better or more spiritual way of living. But then it is also has the very unfortunate, the misunder, misinterpretation has the very unfortunate um, consequence of, has led to uh, women being looked down upon in the history of the church. And that is not the case. It goes against what the rest of scripture says. So if that's not what this means, if this isn't ta literally talking about sexual relations with women, or it's not talking about being um, a literal virgin, then, you know, what is, um, what is it being, what is being discussed? What is being talked about? And I've got four passages here for you. Um, Jeremiah 3, 2 Corinthians 11, Ephesians 5, and James 4. Right. Um, before I read them, what I'll just have to, what I'll say um, is what they all have in common is that in some way or another they des they describe the relationship between God and His people, God and the Church, and in some way or another in terms of marriage. Um, so this is probably clearest in, in Ephesians five. But this is um, the, the idea of God as the bridegroom and the church as the bride of Christ, the, the bride of God, um, is a very common biblical image. And um, to, to have unbelief, to, to unbelief or to be unfaithful to God is, a very, and is captured, is expressed very commonly in the scriptures as adultery. Um, because because God is our bridegroom, to be unfaithful to God is a kind of spiritual adultery. So you read these passages, Jeremiah 3.14, um, God says, Return, faithless people, declares the Lord, for I am your husband. I will choose you, one from a town and two from a clan, and bring you to Zion. So God has the special way of relating to, to the church, God has all kinds of ways of talking about his relationship to us. But one of the ways, one of the beautiful pictures that speaks about God's relationship with his people is um, this picture of God as our husband, that he is the he is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. Or um, this is Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. This is really the Apostle Paul talking about his special relationship with the with the Corinthians. But he says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. So again, what we have in this passage is faithfulness to God being described, or faithfulness to Christ here, faithfulness to Christ being described in terms of virginity. Again, not because living a celibate life is more spiritual or more godly than living a married life, um, uh, but, uh, but the idea of Christ is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. And so to, um, to be faithful to, to Christ, faithfulness to Christ is described, or, or, or um, I should maybe better say, um, a person who hasn't been unfaithful to Christ is being described in terms of being a pure virgin. This, I think, is the clearest one um, where we have the relationship between God and the church likened to the relationship between a husband and a wife. So this is Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, for the church, to make her holy cleansing her with the washing of water through the word, a way of talking about baptism, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So in this context of talking about husbands and wives, the apostle immediately um, begins to talk about the relationship between Christ and the church. 
So this idea of Christ as the bridegroom and the church as the bride and faithfulness to Christ as being um, as, as being ter- in, described in terms of marital faithfulness. And then here's the flip side. Okay, so here's the other side. James is going to describe um, unfaithfulness to God as being an, an, as likening it to spiritual adultery. So James 4.4, 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So to be called an adulterous generation is not so much a commentary on, you know, the, a generation's sexual mores, though it could be that, um, it, it, and it is certainly for our culture. Um, the way that many people are unfaithful to God is through their, the misuse of their sexuality. Um, but really the idea of being called an adulterous generation is just this idea of being unfaithful to God. And so um, this picture in chapter 14, verse 4, um, of the 144,000 being likened to those who did not defile themselves with women or for they remained virgins, is just a biblical way of talking about um, being faithful to Christ. These are the people who were faithful to Christ. They did not commit spiritual, or they do not commit spiritual adultery. They are faithful brides of God or Christ, the bridegroom. In this case, it would be Christ. He's the lamb that begins the vision. Um, another way of saying that, another way of saying that these are the one, um, th- th- these are those who did not defile themselves with women or remain virgins, another way of saying that is that they follow the lamb wherever he goes. It's just another another way of talking about that. What I would say is that's a very interesting picture, too. I didn't put this in the notes, but they follow the lamb wherever he goes. The idea of following Jesus is usually associated with his work as our good shepherd. But here you've got Jesus, not a, um, the sheep of God following, not the shepherd, but the lamb. So you kind of have a mixing of the metaphors, kind of a reversing reversal even of the metaphors um, as... The lamb is the shepherd. Um, Jesus says the good shepherd is also the lamb that was slain. And then the the last little comment that I just have about this verse where um, it's talking about no lie was found in their mouths for they are blameless. Um, Sometimes in the history of the church, it's been said that on the last day, um, the sins of all people are going to be made manifest. In other words, um, the sins that every person commits during their life is going to be laid out for everyone to see. And that that's true even of believers, that even believers are going to, that their sins are going to be laid out, um, that our that believers' sins are going to be made known to everyone. That sometimes has been taught in the history of the church, but it, it's it's not true. On the last day, um, believers' sins are not going to be laid out for everyone to see, because on the last day, we there are no um, this, no lie is found in our mouths. We are blameless. Um, it's not that our sins aren't real or that we didn't really commit those sins, but what is true is that those sins have been taken away. Those sins have been done away with. Those sins have been forgiven. Or those sins have been forgotten. They've been cast into the depths of the sea. Um, and so uh, when God looks at you on the last day, he, he really isn't going to see any of your sins. There aren't going to be any sins there to be brought in front of the, of the world. Um, so sometimes because of a misunderstanding or a misteaching, uh, or incorrect teaching, in the history of the church, some people, some believers have been, have dreaded Judgment Day, or the last day, as a day when all of their sins are going to be shared before the world. Um, but just remember that on Judgment Day, you will have been set free from sin and all of its consequences. And, and won't, you don't need to be afraid of, of those things coming to light, um, because those things have been taken away in Christ. Okay. So that takes us through um, uh, sign number four. So sign number one was the woman and the dragon. Sign number two is the beast out of the sea. 
Sign number three is the beast out of the earth. Sign number four is the lamb and the 144,000. Sign number five, beginning in Revelation chapter 14, verse six, is the vision of the three angels, or the sign of the three angels. So um, this is Revelation chapter 14. We're going to read verses six through 13. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. I'll just note, um, this isn't my notes, but I'll just, this is an interesting um, grouping of four to talk about creation. The heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Um, you've got another grouping of four. Um, to describe creation there. We're, we're used to what we said before, um, every language, nation, tribe, and um, I should go back, every nation, tribe, language, and people. So that's a reference to creation. But you have another list of four to refer to creation with heavens, earth, sea, and springs of water. So it's kind of an interesting detail there. So that's the first angel. The first angel comes and he proclaims the gospel, the gospel to the whole world. Um, calling on the world to worship God. Here's the second angel, verse 8. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. And then here's the third angel, verse 9. A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast or its image and receives its mark on their forehead or in their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image, or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. So a, a lot of really interesting things going on here. Um, the first thing, uh, we'll talk about this first angel, the angel that's flying in midair with the eternal gospel um, and calling people from every tri nation, tribe, language, and people um, to worship God. Um, in, in the history of the Lutheran Church, this is a very important verse um, because Luther is identified as this angel, this messenger who has the gospel. Um, this was the text, um, Revelation 14, 6, was the, or 6 and 7, was the text that was preached at Luther's funeral. Um, and he was identified as that angel. Remember that we have a, more of an idealist interpretation of the book of Revelation. So we'd say, um, really, this, this messenger is any anytime any gospel messenger, any anytime the gospel is proclaimed in its pu truth and purity, the fulfillment of this angel is, um, is being taught or being um, proclaimed. Um, so it certainly would include Luther. Luther is certainly was one of the great preachers of the gospel, but um, so too any faithful pastor who stands up in the pulpit um, and shares the good news of the gospel as a fulfillment of this passage, or whenever any of God's people faithfully shares the gospel with a friend or a family member or a coworker or a neighbor, um, then this, this prophecy is being fulfilled. So it isn't just a, a, a verse about Luther. Um, it's really a verse that it, it includes Luther, but that's because it talks about all faithful proclaimers of the gospel, and Luther was one of those. Um, then you have the second angel coming and proclaiming the fallenness or the downfall of Babylon. Now, Babylon is a very important biblical symbol for all of the enemies of God. Remember um, that Babylon is the nation into which 
Judah gets carried into captivity. So they get carried into captivity in Babylon. So Babylon kind of becomes this great symbol for the enemies of the people of God. Um, probably the second great symbol would be Egypt. Um, but, you know, Babylon and Egypt to be carried away or to be slaves in Babylon, to be slaves in Egypt, is just another way of talking about um, about the enemy, all the enemies of God's people. And so the second angel is declaring the fallenness, um, the, the fact that in this great battle between good and evil, between God and his enemies, um, evil loses. The enemies of God fail to overcome. Really what's being described here is the beginning of Judgment Day. And then the third angel comes, um, and he uh, has really, he is coming to proclaim the negative side of Judgment Day. He's coming to proclaim the judgment that comes on um, those who fail to believe in God, fail to put their trust in Christ as Savior. Um, but what I, what I really want to draw our attention to is verse 10. And he's talking about the, the eternal punishment of those who do not believe in Jesus as Savior. And it says, They too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur, in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. So this is obviously very um, typical or um, common biblical imagery for um, for hell. Okay, so the burning sulfur. Um, and um, sometimes though, sometimes people, especially well-meaning Lutherans who learned way back in catechism class that um, death means separation, and eternal death must mean separation from God. Um, so um, it, it's a it's a common misunderstanding that hell is separation from God. This passage specifically says that isn't the case. This passage specifically says that the those who are judged, the, those who are judged negatively, that those who are being punished in hell are being punished in the presence of the Lamb. Well, the Lamb is Jesus, so the Lamb is God, right? And so um, hell is not separation from God. Hell is separation from God's grace or God's love. Better to say God's grace. Um, it's, it, grace is, is undeserved love, right? Um, but that that's what hell is. It's being separated from God's grace. Um, I have misspoken uh, in, incorrectly in the past, and I've said that hell is a separate, separated from God's goodness. You probably shouldn't speak that way, though, because God's justice is just as good as his grace is. And so um, it's, it's better to speak about hell as being separated from God's grace. If you don't have God's undeserved love, if you're not in the presence of God's undeserved love, then you can only be in the presence of the just the, the suffering that should come upon all of those who who justly suffer God's wrath um, and anger. So you've got angel number one proclaiming the gospel, angel number two proclaiming the fallenness of the defeat of all of God's enemies. You've got angel number three um, proclaiming the the torment or the 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 carrying out of justice against the, the enemies of God. And then we hear a voice from heaven. We're not told whether it's an angel. Um, it could be. But usually when you hear a voice directly from heaven, um, it's God who's speaking. And especially um, when the voice from heaven commands John to write something down. We think about this voice as coming directly from God. And so while the angel is describing the torment of those in hell, um, the voice of God himself describes the, um, the eternal dwelling place of those who die in faith. And he says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Um, so what does Revelation 14, 13 teach the believer about his or her attitude toward death? Um, it really, um, it really teaches us that, um, 
it really teaches us that we um, can, I don't want to say look forward to death, but that we can welcome death, that a Christian can welcome death, um, can know that death, um, for the believer, death is itself a blessing. Um, it is a blessing because it leads to our permanent and final deliverance from sin and all of its consequences. Um, so um, it's it's a it's a really a beautiful verse. You hear this verse read um, read at many funerals, um, or maybe even will be preached on at funerals. Blessed are the dead that for, that in Christ Jesus even death has become a blessing um, because it is the doorway through which we enter everlasting life. Okay, I did um, forget to read the second half of. of verse 14, verse 20, but that's a really good place for us to stop. We're going to stop for this morning, and we'll pick up next week um, by talking about that second half of verse 13, and then we'll look at the, the harvest of God's wrath, so verses 14 to 20, and then we'll look at the introduction to the fourth major vision, the vision of the seven vials. So we um, pray that you be able to worship, or that you're able to join us for um, Bible class again next Tuesday at 1015 here at Bethlehem, um, 45 minutes with the book of Revelation. But let's close with the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us always. Amen. Thank you very much, and God willing, hope to see you again next week.